Welcome to this week's edition of History Now. We're going to look at something quite different from the norm, and we're looking at how uh, musical movements affected society in Ireland. Joining me today is journalist and broadcaster Stuart Bailey and music journalist Conor McCaffrey. You're both very welcome. Just go to you first, Stuart. There's a Troubles Archive essay as reading of yours, and you, you, you talk about, about it in um, terms of what Belfast was like pre-Troubles. It, we tend to think that you know it was a you know conservative society really you know insular. What was music and what was the, you know a music scene like for young people just pre troubles? Well, I was born in sixty one, so I don't really remember what happened in the sixties. But obviously, spoken to a lot of people, like the likes of Terry Hooley and a lot of the people who frequented uh, some of those clubs. And I think Belfast, obviously, the April the seventeenth. Uh, 1964 was year zero. That was the first proper gig that them played at the Maritime Hotel in College Square North. And that was a rhythm and blues club. And that was a band that copped an attitude, that didn't wear uniforms on stage, that turned their back on the audience, that smoked on stage, and was generally a bit leery and, 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 and um, ill-disciplined. Uh, so that was the start of Counterculture, I guess. You know, there, there was, you know, there was a bit of danger in the jazz scene before that, but rhythm and blues brought in the baby boomers and it brought in energy. Terry Hooley talks about, you know, on a Sunday evening in Belfast, people were just hanging out at the city hall, hundreds and hundreds of people. So uh, the Methodist minister opened up his, his church hall for people to sit and have tea, and he called it heaven. And I just thought that's amazing, this idyllic thing that's happening in 1967. And around the same time, you're getting the kind of the ban the bomb, anti-nuclear stuff. You're, 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 you're getting um, the Vietnam War and, and people protesting because there's a, American sailors coming into Belfast. And then people smoking dope in the, uh, in the grounds of the city hall, pretending they're in San Francisco. Uh, so all of these things are, are rolling around and in my mind Astro Weeks by Van Morrison is a picture of, of Eden if you want. It's, it's young people throwing away the, the kind of social conservatism of the previous generation and are not buying into sectarianism and are full of love and full of ideas uh, in, in Madame George. The song on Astro Weeks, Van Morrison's got this transsexual person walking across Cypress Avenue in East Belfast, you know, without a car in the world. And obviously then uh, October 68th, the Duke Street, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the march and January 69 is, is, is burnt hollow and then we're out of that. So just as Astro Weeks arrives in the world in October 68, Northern Ireland's gone down into a dark shit. Mm. Connor, if I can just go to you, your, your research, uh, you look at a different period, but also different city, Dublin. Insular for probably different reasons. Famously, 30s, 40s, 50s, you had economic protectionism and cultural protectionism. And, you know, probably the legacy of that went on a bit longer. Uh, you look at how sort of electronic music and rave culture came in to uh, Dublin. Yeah, yeah. And like, what... what what was it like before that and then when uh, rave culture came in? It's probably a little bit simplistic to suggest that you know, rave culture was way behind. Even actually Steve Silk Hurley's Jack Your Body was number one in 1987, which, is, which I didn't realise until I had looked this week. But also then 1987 you had U2, the Joshua Tree came out, you know, that became, U2 became the biggest band in the world then, that meant that a lot of bands tried to be the next U2, a lot of labels started trying to find the next U2, then the next few years it was probably looked upon as the, we, we talk about the second summer of love in the UK but that was considered a very English thing from here. A lot of the reports if you look back are all based on news reports about you know, raves and it was seen to be at a kind of an English scourge. Even 1990, it's a funny time in Ireland because obviously you've got Italian 90. So if you look at the number one at singles of that year, I think maybe half of it is taken up by uh, Paul McGrath, give him the last check, put him under pressure, which was th those songs were ha like number one for half of the year. 
And then also you had the Fela, which was Ireland's first big uh, music festival, headlined by Meatloaf, Saw Doctors, Van Morrison, who was pretty old at the time, but it was it was very very rock folk based. Moving Hearts were playing, so it, like, it took a while for actual rave culture to be even mentioned about in any kind of cultural mm. aspect. Yeah, do you think that's why it took a while for rave culture to come in? 1990, even though we talk about that, it was almost like a summer of love in Ireland through Italian 90, mm. maybe a couple of years after 1988. But then there was a few important things that happened in Dublin anyway. There was a place called the Electric Ballroom in, in Dublin as well, which hosted its first rave, I think, in April 1990 for DJs like uh, Johnny Moy, Mark Kavanagh. Also, you had, which Stuart actually writes about quite brilliantly in his book, talking about Orbital's first appearance in Belfast. David Holmes invited them over to play and they were just so bowled over. They were really worried about coming over originally, thinking, you know, are we going to get blown up here? Are we going to, is there going to be a lot of trouble? But they were just so, they just couldn't believe. A lot of people were coming together. Mm. You know, there was no Protestant Catholic animosity. It was, you know, the, I think something that Paul Hartnell said, it was our very first ever, it was our first encore because they, they wouldn't let them leave after they played. And then, they just named the song Belfast, which to this day has become one of their most famous tracks. And it's still one of their encore songs to this day. It's just little moments like that. Also, I think possibly one of the first times uh, the Ma Mansion House in Dublin as well hosted raves, which was strange when you think of it now. But there was at one point where Tony Gregory, who was, uh, he was a kind of anti-drugs counsellor, he brought some film crews and like uh, campaigners to let's see what all these evil drug people, all these evil ravers are doing. But he did report back that it was, you know, we give it the thumbs up, probably not realising that there was no trouble because people weren't drinking, people were taking drugs. Yeah. The alcohol industry was terrified of rave, you know, because people stopped drinking alcohol and were drinking water. Obviously there, were, there was pills involved to, to some degree. But I certainly, when I was I was working at the NME when rave happened, and uh, you could feel that there was lobby groups at Westminster and stuff saying we have to stop this. We're making so much money by selling overpriced alcohol in bars or in clubs, and all of a sudden that had stopped. You know, and to the degree that they were turning off taps in clubs to stop yeah, to make people was, buy yeah. bottled water and stuff. And I think that the, the establishment was terrified. Uh, in terms of money, uh, as well as these people behaving in ways that they couldn't understand and couldn't monitor, it was amazing. Yeah, because it took it took a few years. I think through the nineties there was this there was obviously a, a resistance against rave culture. But then by maybe two thousand two thousand and one, you had Witness Festival, which was sponsored by Guinness, and then that was the that was the old start of. You know, every festival now is sponsored by a drinks company. Get the kids back on the drink. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Looking back now, you know, anybody who is sort of passionate about music or has an inter interest in music in Northern Ireland are, seem quite proud of the fact that there was a really vibrant punk scene in Belfast. I'm arguably, you know, in terms of music, we're, we're famous for that. But what was that? What was that like at the time? Because I'm thinking, you know, the you know the Sax Pistols appearance on Grundy's show. You get the next day, you get the Filth and the Fury. What was the reaction to punk when it was coming up in what was, a, you know, a conservative society? Well, the over, over grand story was the Filth and the Fury, and it was spitting and safety pins, and uh, you know, part of the the way the Sex Pistols were presented to the world was to outrage and the last rock and roll band to destroy rock and roll. That was their mission. And the tabloids ran along with that. And, and uh, you know, the Anarchy Tour, uh, we, I think half the dates were canceled. And when the Clash were playing, you know, seats were being ripped out and, and all of that. So there was uh, a lot of negative stuff out there. And, and there's always a folk devil in popular culture, be it rave or be it hip hop with Snoop Dogg or whoever, you know, there, there, there's somebody out there that uh, has it all pinned on the, the, their shoulders. So uh, the adults were going, oh, this is awful. To be a teenager, especially in those relatively early years of punk, there were people uh, who were hip to it before I became aware, but 
the first Clash album, and a lot of the Sex Pistols stuff was all about personal liberation. It was about thinking for yourself. Uh, the, the critic, Grail Marcus in America, says you can boil punk down to two words, and it's question everything. So it is have a review of your whole life, have a review of your situation where you're in, have a review of your politics, have a review of your traditions. So you throw that into Northern Ireland and all of a sudden these teenagers are being encouraged to think for themselves and go, okay, I don't have to be part of either of the tribes, the two tribes, they, they, you know, they, they, I don't have to be in one of those trenches. Uh, I don't have to be stuck with all that baggage. I can think for myself. I might, uh, after thinking about it, you know, decide that it's valid or some of this stuff is cool. But also, uh, that, that's, my, that's my decision. It's not, it's not group think. Um, so, so while the adults were tut tutting about the, the, the superficial stuff about punk, as a teenager, you were suddenly empowered. You, fe you felt like an entity. You were, you were making your own choices. You were getting out of bed excited. There were records coming out every week. Uh, there were places like Good Vibrations, uh, like a record shop where Terry Hooley, this, this bizarre hi hippie anarchist, would spout off and, 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 and Dave Heintman was upstairs and there's a whole food uh, uh, shop downstairs. So you're in the middle of this kind of training ground for the revolution. Um, and you're going to the Hart Bar in 78 and you're meeting people from the other side of town and you both like the same records and, and you, you're both kind of rejecting what's been before. So all of those things were, were flipped and um, the, the trashy stuff you were reading in the Sunday papers, you kind of thought this was funny because it, it, it was almost a smokescreen and underneath it all you were getting on with the real business at hand, which was um, just uh, instinctively inching towards what Stiff Little Fingers called an alternative Ulster, which was this idea that you could, it was a utopia, there was this other thing that, that, that could be out there and it didn't have to be about hating your neighbours. Yeah, so there's like a major disconnect between the media and what was happening on the ground. These days we don't really have youth culture, we don't mm. have counter culture, everybody mm. dresses the same. I think rave music was the last big counter culture. Um, and, and, and when I was growing up, you expected something to come along every couple of years, yeah. be it, you know, Two-Tone or, or New Romantic or Rockabilly and, you know, all of these things happening all the time. And, and, and always it, it was a job of work to kind of alienate your parents and, and stop them from understanding you. So, so that, was the, that was the fun of it, that, that you know, it, it literally was you had to keep moving ahead of, 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 of what, you know, you didn't want to be pinned down. You didn't want certainly the, the, the square conservative media to, 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 to kind of get a handle on what you were doing. Um, and and that, was, that was all over the UK and Ireland. But in, in, in certainly when I was growing up in Belfast, that was just so exciting. You were, you were dodging it all, you know. Connor, that's something that you've looked at in your research about rave culture, uh, the disconnect probably between the media and what was happening in the clubs and stuff like that there. Do you, you've looked at comparisons between how punk was portrayed in Britain and how rave was portrayed by the media in, in Ireland. Yeah, was yeah. that sort of Ireland's, uh, Southern Ireland's punk, punk moment? The funny thing is, whenever you look back, it was always demonised as this English kind of thing that was coming in. And those, those were the stories that it wasn't happening in our, in our backyard almost. The, that's, whenever you're talking about uh, subculture, the whole, the whole idea of even before rave culture started and there was the moral panics about the drugs, the subcultures are, are kind of based around what they aren't. So if even in the 70s, whenever craft work were being interviewed, it was, that's not even music. So automatically you're thinking this isn't music. Um, Lester Bangs had a really famous article, or infamous more like, that he did a, an interview with Kraftwerk called, the headline was something like the final solution to the music problem and then the headline of the, was all this na Nazi imagery so automatically this was this extreme other, othering of, of a type of music that was coming in and this, is, this was Kraftwerk who were studying in conservatories so by the time uh, punk music or by the time rave music came in it was just considered 
just either a novelty and just a way of, it just seemed to be hedonism. It was talked about in terms, even you know, as, as soon as something isn't really understood or something isn't, a uh, culture is, it starts being mis misrepresented. So in, in, in um, Parliament, it was, they were talked about uh, locals being terrorised. They were talked about army divisions of sound systems. You know, it just seems so quaint now yeah. whenever... Militarising the, the terms Yeah, militarising yeah. the movement. Talking about, uh, this was discussing the castle, the really famous Castle Morton Rave in 1992, which led to the Criminal Justice Bill in 1994, which banned the use of repetitive beats, which was just seemed quite arbitrary at the minute at the time as well. Yeah, but there's a, there's a thing that I read in your research where you talked about the pe people were actually making comparisons because of that repetitive beat, making the comparisons with punk and the three chords and, and things like that there. So it was really sort of doing it an injustice, you know, that it wasn't a worthy form of, of art. I think that three, Here's Three Cards Start a Band was almost like a meme of, of the time. You know, it wasn't really supposed to be in any way to kind of cast aspersions on the music. It was more like, uh, let's go out and do this. You know, now you have, you have the very basic building blocks of let's go forward. You know, you've got all, it's more important, the idea is more important. Which after maybe in the early or mid 80s, whenever electronic instruments became really quite mass produced, you know, maybe in the 70s, you had artists like Jean Michel Jarre, Kraftwerk, who were studied in conservatories and they were, you know, kind of working on similar templates to avant garde musicians or prog rock almost. Then you had these kids who were probably just very similar to the punk idea of just like, we have this new bass, bass uh, synthesizer or drum machine let's just go ahead and see what we can do a lot of the the most iconic tracks came out of just accidents like uh, acid tracks was an accident uh, you know a lot of these were just people just kids with so much time on their hands just sitting all day and coming up with happy accidents Stuart, if we can change, change tack a minute here, uh, you've already mentioned Madame George. There's a, an, an entry in your blog where you talk about 50 years of uh, music that affects you know, the LGBT community. Um, in most other places, you know, that would be looked upon as history, but here it's not. You know, it's very contemporary. You know, can you give us a sense of you know, that, that history in Northern Irish music? You know, Madam George by Van Morrison is, is 68, and as, as I said, it's, it's, it's about someone of indeterminate gender walking through East Belfast with a, a soldier and a bottle of wine late at night. Uh, and I'm sure that was an interesting evening. In that song as well, there's a police raid on a, on a party, and this figure, Madam George, decides to leave town, and you can feel the fear and the anxiety. And, and um, you know, this is at a time when the, uh, so 67 is partial legalization of homosexuality in the UK, which never extends to Northern Ireland, you know, and, and, and you have to look back to things like De Profundis by Oscar Wilde to get that feeling of mm -hmm. what it was like at the turn of that century and the, 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 the being an absolute scapegoat, living in fear and uh, humiliation. Um, so so in, in, in the late 60s, You've got things like the film performance and Mick Jagger is, is almost like a drag queen in it. You've got kink songs like See My Friends where they're celebrating kind of this, this gay uh, kind of feeling that's, that's coming into music. Um, you know, Andrew Luke Oldham, who managed the Rolling Stones, was encouraging the Rolling Stones to be camp, you know. So, so all of this is going on and in Northern Ireland, you can get arrested right, right all the way through the 70s and stuff. So it, it wasn't necessarily spoken about a lot, um, but now uh, it, it is very much at the cutting edge of counterculture in Northern Ireland. So you listen to someone like Susie Blue and a song like People Like Us, they, they say it's all a choice. You know, that's, that's talking about DUP, you know, mindset, you know. Um, and, and, that, that whole vibe of, of being an outcast in your own place and 
and, and, and the civil rights that, that are still on, 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 on achieved, or, or marriage equality, which, which doesn't exist here. So th th there's a series of, th of songs about that, and you know, a song like Soak uh, Sea Creatures is about uh, homophobia in a playground. And there's, there's, there's a whole series of other songs about that, and a whole series of artists here are, are making a very strong point about it. Um, you know, there's a band called Strange New Places, uh, again, who've got a series of songs about wanting to leave and, and feeling like this is a place to avoid. It's, it's just too much to deal with. So, so that's all interesting that, you know, the Pride marches and the, and the marriage equality marches in Belfast are the most exciting moments almost in, in Northern Ireland now because rock music is a wee bit dull. It doesn't say too much. We've had our moments with rave culture in the past and what, what David Holmes was doing at Sugar's Week was so exciting. But I think um, borders, uh, constraints, personal liberties are where it's at at the minute in Northern Ireland. And I think that's brilliant. And I think anyone who's part of the music community is saying that there's cracks in the, uh, uh, there's cracks in the, in the boundary. Let's, Let's put the levers into the cracks and, and bring down that, that, that ugly uh, thing that's happening here. Yeah. Do you think that people who are doing that now have a history of that to draw upon in music? You know? I don't know if there's too much of a trail in, in, in Northern Ireland music, um, but there is, if you look around, uh, I, and when you put it into an All-Ireland con context, there's a villager song called Hot Scary Summer, which is all about homophobia in the streets of Dublin and not wanting to embrace your partner outdoors because there's there's homophobes around. Uh, there's a ma an amazing track by Phil Chevron from the Radiators in Dublin. It's called Under Cleary's Clock and it's about having a, a date in Dublin and you're meeting your partner, your same sex partner under Cleary's Clock and this person hasn't turned up or, or might be late and the anxiety and the pain and and, 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 and there's a mention of the, 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 the Oscar Wilde, Alfred line, um, the love that dare not speak its name. So there's a whole line from, from uh, Oscar Wilde right up through uh, Irish culture, which is, which is about that unspoken thing, that feared thing, and now that's very much out in the open. And, and, and for 26 counties and for the rest of the UK, it's all permissible now, there, there is equality. And in these remaining six counties, there is still oppression and uh, intolerance, mostly from religious fundamentalists. You were recently in Colombia. Yeah. Um, looking at how music has been involved in the Colombian peace process. Now, we have, you know, there's, it's really well known about people being involved from music in the peace process here. What are the comparisons between there and Colombia? And is it... Is it um, driven from the ground up, or is it, you know, is it, is there a corporate stamp on it? Well, the, there's all sorts of uh, music coming out of. Well, I was in Bogota, and you you were trying to pick up as much as you can. Uh, at that stage, they thought that the war was over, and there was going to be a referendum, which which the referendum said actually no, there was no agreement. But uh, at that point, you had FARC guerrillas were coming out of the the forests and the mountains and stuff, and. Uh, they were handing them instruments and saying, like, form a band, <laughs> you know, that, you know, you'd have, you, you don't know any other life. Mm. Why don't you, you know, express your culture, express your feelings musically? So, so obviously that was one small part of how you deal with, with, with post-conflict, but that was absolutely fascinating. The other extreme was this, the, the, these narco songs, which were like kind of hip hop, kind of exaggerated, and it was all about uh, drug drug dealers killing each other, you know, and and that in in Latin America, in in, in Mexico, and below, uh, that was a big that was almost perceived as a problem because they were making it look really cool to to kind of shoot up everybody, <laughs> the, because you could sell more cocaine than your mate. Uh, so so I, I my small visit there, you know, and I was saying, look, in Northern Ireland, it took Bono, Trimble, Hume, and the band Ash to swing the referendum. Uh, in 1998, so uh, you know, music can play its part. It steps up to the plate now and again. But other times, uh, you gotta you gotta let other people help to to put an infrastructure around it and and let music copper fasten whatever positivity there is going on. Yeah. So it seems that 
with our case, you know, fr from what you said with them at the beginning, a bit, you know, sort of anti-establishment. You come right to 1998 where you say with Bono, with Ash, they're basically infiltrated the mainstream to, to try and direct it in some sort of positivity. Well, music saved Northern Ireland at a time when, when, when there was so many, the mainstream was spooked, the moderates were spooked, they were going like, we're on a new dawn, what's happening? And the musicians said, we're, we're going to go for it. You know, we're going we're gonna to show, um, we're going to stage the handshake. We're going to put 2,000 young people in the waterfront and, and, and put out good vibes at a time when there's just bad news stories. So that was a brilliant moment in time. And, and more, more recently then with the death of Lyra McKee, it is musicians and creative people and journalists and media that are helping to say this was a, an appalling waste and this is a, a wrong fork in the road and um, we need to get back on the good mm -hmm. foot. Yeah. Connor, you know, we're not in the peace process territory with um, rave culture or anything, but an interesting, you know, trajectory you've looked at from its demonization right through to being recuperated in the mainstream and you alluded that to, with, you know, the festivals and that. How have you saw that, uh, you know, that journey? Yeah, it's a funny, it's that, that sociological term, recuperation, just kind of suggests that it's maybe the establishment is coming in to save it, to make it better. Mm -hmm. This has been going on since maybe the whole of the 20th century. You had the, all the folk devils of jazz music. You know, you had Elvis being censored, his hips being censored. You had gangster rap, you had devil music in, in uh, heavy metal, rave culture, as Stuart said, probably the last big uh, youth culture that had any uh, real sway. Now you see it on, on the Channel 4 news or whatever, you know, that the kids with guns in, in Dalston, you know, and then it's all because they're listening to music and, uh, you know, in five years from now, people will be celebrating those tunes, you know? Yeah, what happens is Within 10, 20 years, people just see that the moral panic is really quaint and they don't realise at the time mm. that that's what's happening. So whenever you look back now and you just think of whenever they were, it was talked about almost as if ravers were terrorists. And then you have rave culture now is the, and hip hop is the de facto pop music worldwide, even more so than rock music. Like where, where we, we're recording today, you have the AVF festival, techno festival that's on in the Titanic quarter, which is you know Northern Ireland's biggest tourist attraction. You have a dance music conference in the Mac. You know, it's just you have David Holmes winning BAFTAs. You have D1 Records, which is the Dublin um, record label. Um, Eamon Doyle is, has his f photography being shown all over the world. He's like one of the most famous artists on earth at the minute. It just seems quaint now that it seemed to be this almost demonization of, of music where it's now just the main culture really. Like every festival now, it's uh, the, the, everything is sponsored. You know, you go to Electric Picnic, there's a Tesco. You can get your clothes washed at a uh, personal place or you know that's it's just it gets ridiculous so it's there's no counterculture left in dance music anymore well thanks very much for both coming on i look forward to whatever the next counterculture moment that comes up Stuart, connor thanks very much thanks a lot okay.